In order for a trust to be valid, the three certainties must be present, as illustrated in the case of Knight and Knight. Or, as the court held in the case of Wright and Atkins, the words must be imperative, the subject must be certain, and so must be the objects. Imperative words simply means words which allow the court to ascertain certainty of intention. However, it is important that you understand that there are no set words that need to be used in order to create a trust. Hence the equitable maxim, equity focuses on intention rather than form. In addition, as you will see, not only are the words relevant, but so is the context. So whether it's a family context or it's a commercial context. And also the conduct is relevant. What did the parties actually do? Now, first things first, you must not get trusts and other dispositions of property mixed up. In particular, sometimes a gift can seem like a trust, but actually equity will not assist a volunteer, i.e. a person that has not provided consideration will not be assisted in equity. Thus, it is crucial that you are able to recognise what the property owner is intending to achieve and whether or not they have fulfilled the necessary requirements. A gift involves an outright transfer of ownership without being exchanged for consideration, so the donee doesn't provide considera consideration. The difference between a gift and the trust is that with a gift, the donee becomes the sole outright owner of the property and can, can treat it however they want essentially because it's their property, they own it outright completely. Trustees on the other hand do not have personal rights over the trust property. It belongs to the beneficiary, not the trustee. The trustee merely owes a fiduciary duty to the beneficiary. One of the leading cases on gifts is the case of Re Cole. In that case Mr Cole purchased a house in London and had several items in that house that he intended to give to his wife as gifts. He intended to transfer these items to his wife um, as gifts. Now Mr Cole took his wife to this new house and he had his hands over her eyes and then upon entering he took his hands off and the gifts were all there and he said it's all yours. Now at this time Mr Cole was a very wealthy man but he later went into bankruptcy after one of his business partners passed away. The trustee in bankruptcy took possession of the six items that Mr. Cole intended to dispose of as gifts to his wife and the wife contended that she was entitled to the proceeds of sale as they were given to her as gifts. The Court of Appeal however rejected that contention on the basis that there had been no delivery or change in possession. They were of the opinion that words themselves could not perfect a gift, there has to be something more Lord Justice Harmon in particular said that a gift of chattels is not complete unless accompanied by something which constitutes an act of delivery or change in possession. And that's really the principle of this case, he essentially summed it up in one line. A gift of chattels is not perfected unless accompanied by something which constitutes an act of delivery or change in possession. However, there is an obvious problem that can be seen in cases such as recall. Let's say you're a married couple or you're cohabiting. If you live with someone, then a change in possession in the strict sense is not as easy as it would be if, the, unless, you know, if, if you lived apart, it'd be much easier, especially if the goods are bulky. Let's say you order furniture, okay? You're a married couple or you're cohabiting, you order furniture. You both have that furniture in the house you live in. A change in possession in the strict sense is not really possible and that's one of the problems the court encountered with this case. But the court also referred to the case of irons and small piece where it was said that in order to transfer property by gift there must be either a deed or instrument of gift or there must be an actual delivery of the thing to the donee. So where a change in possession in the strict sense is impossible what the party may wish to do is create a deed. That way, in accordance with Irons and Small Piece, the gift will be perfected. So really the principle in recall applies where a deed 
of transfer was not actually used. If the donor did not create a deed to execute the gift, then the court will look to whether or not there was a delivery or change in possession. Had this case involved something like a ring or a bracelet or a watch um, or just something of that nature, something small, not bulky, um, and the wife accepted the gift, maybe she wore it, she put it in a jewellery box, um, then the outcome would have been different. There would have been a change of possession, but that was not the facts. And the court did say that a way that delivery can occur would be through what's called constructive delivery or symbolic delivery. Now, they're two different types of delivery. Um, in relation to the former, they referred to the case of winter and winter. In that case, the gift was already in possession of the donee. It was a barge that the donee, who, who in this case was uh, the son of the donor, uh, he, was, he was working on the barge and then the father said, OK, you can have it. I want you to have this barge. And the court in recall said that in winter and winter, delivery had preceded the gift, but that was enough. So where delivery precedes the gift, that will be enough. If the donor is already in possession of the gift and then the donor says, OK, you can have this, that will be sufficient. And in relation to symbolic delivery, they referred to the case of Rawlinson and Mort. Um, the court said in Rawlinson and Mort, if the chattels be many or bulky, there may be symbolic delivery. As, for instance, of a chair, as was the case in Lock and Heath, or about the case of a gift of a church organ. Uh, and, and there they were actually referring to Rawlinson and Moore. It was a church organ in that case. And because it was big, delivery in the strict sense couldn't occur. They couldn't say, OK, here you go. And there couldn't be a change in possession. Uh, but essentially where the donor puts his hand upon um, the intended gift in the presence of the donee and accompanied his gesture with words of gift, then the gift will be perfected. So if you put your hands on a church organ and say, I want you to have this church organ, that will be sufficient. That will be symbolic delivery and uh, the gift would have been perfected. So that's what the court said. Um, and in recall, there had been no constructive delivery and there had been no symbolic delivery. There had been no delivery, there had been no change in possession at all. It was essentially an imperfect gift. And the court is not willing to make right an imperfect gift. So the ratio of this case is essentially that there must be a clear intention to create a trust. Okay, no, sorry, scratch that. I'm thinking about the case there. I just drifted off. The ratio in this case is that in order for a gift to be perfected, uh, there must be the intention to create a gift and there must be delivery in one of the ways referred to in recall. So essentially, sum, to sum it down, there must be intention plus delivery. And just some academic, well, not academic, some judicial commentary, even uh, some judicial commentary for you, essentially on why the court will not impose a trust because of a failed gift. Lord Cramworth, in this case, uh, said that it would be very dangerous if loose conversations of this sort and transactions of this kind should have the effect of creating a trust. And if you think about it, Lord Cranworth was right, because if the court did say that a trust had been created, then in every case where there had been a failed gift, a trust would arise. And that will just be impractical, that will clog the courts, that would be just to impose something which the parties, which the settler didn't really intend to do. One way you can determine uh, whether or not the property owner intended to make an outright gift by transfer or to create a trust, you can pay attention to the type of words they used. Did their words reflect an intention to create a trust or an intention to create a gift? Essentially, the question is, were the words imperative or were they precatory? The former would, infect, would, uh, sorry, would reflect an intention to create a gift, whereas the latter, precatory words, would, it, would reflect an intention to create a gift. Now, the Oxford Legal Dictionary defines precatory words as words accompanying a gift, desiring, hoping, trusting, or requesting that the donee will dispose of the property in a particular way. The key words there, in my opinion, are words accompanying a gift and uh, the words hoping. Because if you remember earlier on, I referred to the case of Wright and Atkins, where the court said that the words must be imperative. 
and words that show not really specific intention but words of hope words of desire they are not specific they're not imperative they're not commanding enough so they do not reflect certainty of intention to create trust but there is an exception to this uh, and that derived from the case of Comiskey and Bowring Hanbury uh, essentially where precatory words words are used but later on in the document or wherever the words are it is made clear what is actually supposed to happen to the property then it doesn't matter that precatory words were used essentially the document must be analyzed in its entirety it's not good to just it's not right to just focus on the precatory words and say right this isn't there's no uncertainty of intention because you've not read the whole document you've not read all of the words you need to pay attention to all of the words where the settler makes clear what's to happen to property that will override the precatory words now you can create the trust by declaring yourself to be a trustee if you're a settler or you can appoint another person to be a trustee or numerous people to be a trustee so in short you can create a trust through self-declaration or through appointment you can also create a trust in two different ways in the commercial context but i'm going to come into that in the next video i'm going to come into that uh, in part two for certainty of intention now the case of Paul and Constance provides an example of a settler creating a trust through self-declaration. In this case, the claimant was married to the deceased, who was Mr. Constance. Uh, Mr. Constance had acquired a sum of money in damages for an accident at work. And he opened up a bank account in his sole name, but he made arrangements with the bank so that his partner could, with his signature, withdraw money from the account. Now, Mr. Constance often said to uh, the claimant, the money is yours as much as it is mine. Furthermore, they both put money into this account and they both withdrew money as a joint venture and they split equally what they had not spent. They also regularly played bingo and put their winnings into this account and they referred to the winnings as our winnings. When the deceased died, when Mr. Constance died, his partner, the claimant, sought to claim the money in that account on the basis that it was being held on trust for her. And the issue was whether or not there was sufficient evidence that the deceased, Mr. Constance, had declared a trust for the benefit of the claimant. The court held that there must be a clear declaration of trust and it must be evidenced from the words said and done to dispose of the property so that somebody else acquires a beneficial interest. And in this particular case, there was sufficient evidence, despite the lack of formality. There was no actual need for Mr. Constance to say anything like, I declare myself a trustee of this money for the benefit of my partner. Uh, Lord Justice Bridge referred to the obit to, di sorry, the obit to dicta of Sir George Jessel in Richards and Delbridge, who said that, it is true, he need not use the words, I declare myself a trustee, but he must do something which is equivalent to it and use expressions which have that meaning. So that was said by Sir George Jessel in Richards and Delbridge. Uh, so despite the informal wording used by Mr. Constance, i.e. the money is yours as much as it is mine, there had been a valid declaration of trust. He had said he said something equivalent to calling himself a trustee. He declared himself a trust. So he declared himself a trustee. It was a trust through self-appointment. And you need to understand that the context is very relevant too. Firstly, it was the family context. Families, people in domestic scenarios, are not expected to use legalese. They cannot be expected to use specialist legal language, but rather go about their dealings using ordinary terms. Secondly, Mr. Constance was described as having an unsophisticated character. So essentially he wasn't very bright. However, had he been a specialist in trust law, then the court would have arrived at a different conclusion because they would have recognized that if he was a barrister specializing in trust law for example he would have taken much greater steps in ensuring that the money was to be held on trust for the claimant
This case also shows that you can create a trust without intending to create one in the legal sense. The words of Mr. Constance demonstrated that he intended to create, I guess you could call the substance of the trust, i.e. sharing the money with the claimant beneficially, but he probably had absolutely no idea that the words he used would create a trust in the legal sense. And because he was declaring himself to be a trustee, no formalities were actually needed. When you create a trust through self-appointment, when you appoint yourself to be a trustee and you are the settler, you do not need to carry out any formalities because you hold the legal title. You see, when, when a party appoints another person to be a trustee, legal title has to be transferred in order for the trust to be valid because you cannot be a trustee unless you have legal title. And this is something that Paul and Constance demonstrates. There was no need to transfer legal title. And an example of somebody appointing a person to be a trustee, appointing a third party, uh, can be seen in the case of Gold and Hill, where the settler, the property owner, had a conversation with his friend over dinner and said to his friend, if anything happens to me, you know what to do. Look after Carol and her kids and don't let that bitch get anything. And by that bitch, he was referring to his wife. That concludes part one of Certainty of Intention. I shall move on to part two very shortly and I shall be covering trusts in the commercial context.